Coming up next on the Passion Struck Podcast. The last two years, two and a half years really for me have been filled with those defining moments. It's been a really hard couple of years on personal levels, professional levels. I've experienced a lot of loss, a lot of grief. And in that process, as brutal as it's been, I am a completely different person. I'm a completely different mama. I'm a completely different writer. I'm a completely different everything. I wanted to remember that every great thing I have in my life came on the other side of hardship, came on the other side of a difficult season or a hard lesson to learn. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become Passion Struck. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 191 of Passion Struck, recently ranked by Apple as one of the top 10 most popular health podcasts. And thank you to each and every one of you who come back weekly to listen and learn how to live better, be better, and impact the world. And if you're new to the show, thank you so much for being here, or you would like to introduce this to a friend or family member. We now have episode starter packs, both on the Passion Struck website, as well as Spotify. And these are collections of our fans' favorite episodes that we organize into convenient topics that give any new listener a great way to get acquainted to everything we do here on the show. Just go to passionstruck.com slash starter packs to get started. And in case you missed my episodes from last week, they included an interview with Dr. Scott Berry Barry Kaufman and Jordan Feingold about the release of their new book, Choose Growth. And we deep dive the power of transcending things like trauma, worry, and self-doubt. I also had on former monk and Hindu priest, Don Napani, and we discuss and explore his new book, The Power of Unwavering Focus, and why having a purpose-focused life is so important to becoming our best selves. And lastly, during my solo episode, I explored the age-old concept of free will and whether or not it exists. Please check all those episodes out if you haven't. And I wanted to thank you so much for the five-star ratings and reviews that you all keep giving this show. We now have over 10,000 of them globally on Apple alone, and they mean so much to us to improve the popularity of this podcast as well as growing this passion-struck community. Now, let's talk about today's guest. Rachel Hollis is a three-time New York Times best-selling author, the host of the extremely popular Rachel Hollis Show, which now has over 100 million downloads. She is known for her authenticity and optimism and uses her platform to embolden and empower fellow dreamers. Her energy and real talk have made her one of the most sought after motivational speakers in the world. Rachel is also the founder of Rise Conferences, the number one personal development conference entirely focused on women. And in our interview today, Rachel discloses with vulnerability what the most important things are to her during this season of her life. What she has found are the keys over the past 16 years for her not only reinventing her business, but reinventing herself. I ask her a very probing question about what people always get wrong about her. Why she ended up overhauling her complete social media strategy and the impact that it has made. Rachel and I both have this tendency not to celebrate our successes, and she gives her best advice for enjoying moments of progress. We explore why the hard seasons in life allow us to appreciate more fully the good things in life. She gives her advice on how do you decide what you must let go of and what must be in your life. She talks about sitting with her pain and why there is power in accepting waves of grief. We also explore the importance of the gap and the gain, as well as so many more topics. Truly an episode that you don't want to miss out on. Thank you for choosing Passion Struck and choosing me to be your host and guide on your journey to creating an intentional life. Now, let that journey begin. I am completely humbled and ecstatic to welcome Rachel Hollis to the Passion Strike Podcast. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, I happened to catch your solo episode from last week, and we both have kids that are going back to school, but I passed 
a huge milestone. My oldest daughter, Olivia, graduated high school, so we dropped her off at Florida. Oh, wow. And I can tell you it was such a bittersweet moment. But you also mentioned how your four kids are now back at school. And I wanted to start off this interview by having you talk about we all have seasons in our lives. And what is going on in this season of yours? Yeah, well, first of all, I like literally could tear up you telling that story because I have been worried. Worried's not the right word, but I've had feelings about my oldest going away to college literally since the day that I brought him home from the hospital. I remember holding him in his room and rocking him and my now ex-husband came in and I was crying and he was like, what is wrong? And I'm like, he's going to leave someday. So I'm sure that that process, which is she your oldest? No, her brother is 24. Okay, so you've had the practice before, but I just want to shout out all of the parents who are doing that because I feel like it's like probably putting your heart outside of your body. But this season for me is, it's pretty busy. I'm going to be honest. I am on deadline for my next book. So that looks like a lot of writing. I do my writing in the first part of every day. So I'm navigating school drop-offs, get my writing done, then move into, I'm using air quotes, sort of regular work. I know that writing is my work, but I also do podcasts and have a business to run. So I move into my regular work. And then if the Lord is, what is that saying? If the Lord's willing and the creek don't rise, I can get a workout (laughs) in before I pick the little kids up from school. And honestly, by the time they get home, I'm basically in mom mode. So I've learned inside of COVID, like pre-COVID, I had an office outside of the house and I went and I did like nine to four every day, but I've learned inside of this new world to get a ton of work done in a small amount of time to be laser focused and to get what I need done. And that really allows me such a better quality of life because I'm more present in my real life. I'm more present with my kids and I'm able to, I think, navigate those both really well, both work and uh, mom life. Yes, I do something similar. I really front load my day as well because I find myself most cognitively present during the morning hours. So the most important thing I've got to tackle, I try to do first. Yeah. And oftentimes that is writing because to be creative, you really have to be fully present in your thoughts. Right. I think that people don't often give enough attention to when their mindset, their brain, like when all of those things are at their best. For us, it sounds like that's earlier in the day, but I have friends who are night owls and that really is when their creativity comes alive. And I think it's about learning what's going to work best for you. And really to the best of your ability, because we don't always have full control of our schedule, but to the best of your ability, building your days around what you want to accomplish and how you can best set yourself up for that. I think sometimes when we're earlier in this personal development journey, we listen to a podcast or watch a YouTube video, read a book, and then we try and emulate someone else's ideology because we're not really sure what else to do. But what is most effective is to really build around what works for you, what works for your family, your partner, whatever it is that's happening in real life to get you closer to that goal. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Well, on this theme of seasons, we all have different moments in our life that are defining moments. And I think those influence the different seasons that we're in. What's a defining moment for you and some of your takeaways from it? Oh my gosh, I have had so many. I think, you know, This, the last two years, two and a half years really for me have been filled with those defining moments. It's been a really hard couple of years on personal levels, professional levels. I've experienced a lot of loss, a lot of grief. And in that process, as brutal as it's been, I am a completely different person. I'm a completely different mama. I'm a completely different writer. I'm a completely different everything. And not that I would want to go through something that hard again, but I think that the last couple of years have really served as a reminder. Like I have this tattoo on my wrist that says, embrace the suck. I got this after I did this, uh, it's called the Everest challenge. You climb the same mountain over and over and over. And if you can climb it 
the right amount of times in under 36 hours, you've climbed the equivalent of Everest. So after I did that, I got this tattoo that says embrace the suck because I wanted to remember that every great thing I have in my life came on the other side of hardship, came on the other side of a difficult season or a hard lesson to learn. And I find that again and again, it's not fun to walk through those hard times, but I wouldn't trade it for all that I've learned in the process or the life I get to live now because of what I've gone through. Yeah, I love that saying. And it's something that when I was in the military, we would say a lot, especially when I was with the SEAL teams. And yep. it's absolutely embracing the suck. And then what do you do with that? And yeah. that kind of leads me to one of your books, which I couldn't put down. I read it in one quick sitting. Through reading that and knowing a lot about you through my research, you and I have both endured a lot of trauma in our past. And I agree with you that these hard seasons allow us to see the great times that we've had and they become more present. And in the book, you wrote that, and I loved it, when humans go through something hard, they come out on the other side for better or worse. I've certainly found this true in my life. What is your suggestion for what people can do to work to get over their challenges in a way that's for the better? Well, I think that one, we have to readjust our perception of what life is supposed to be because the internet has been amazing for so many reasons, but one of the tricky things that has happened with the invention of the internet and the invention of social media is that we've been given the perfect visual, right? We've been given the great Instagram photo, the amazing YouTube video. We're seeing people's highlight reels. We're seeing the best of the best. We're seeing people when they're at the top of their game. And it does really mess with our psychology to make us believe that that's what life is like all the time, that we always have it together, that we always have the right answer, that we always do the right thing or win the game or, or have successes. And that's just not real and it's not accurate and it's hurtful to believe something different. My audience is predominantly women. So I can tell you after 15 years of doing this work that the thing women are most petrified of is failure. They're so afraid of getting it wrong. They're so afraid of doing it wrong. And if you unpack that with them, if you sort of dig deeper and try and understand the psychology there, what you find is that they're not afraid of failing. They're afraid of other people seeing them fail. Those are two very different things. And if you're afraid of other people seeing you fail, you will never do anything. You will never run for political office in your hometown. You'll never start the business. You'll never ask that guy out on a date. You'll never do anything different than exactly the comfort zone that you currently live inside of. So what I've found is that a readjustment of the way that we look at things, I think that this life that we are blessed enough to get to live is supposed to be an experiment. We're supposed to try stuff and see how it goes. And if that doesn't work, we try something else. If that doesn't work, we try something else again. In my own life and my own business, my career, how I've shown up as a parent or a partner, it really has been just testing stuff out. When we brought our kids home from the hospital, we didn't know what we were doing. Then like the baby would be crying and you try something and then like, okay, they're still crying. That's not the answer. And you're like, well, we got to figure it out. We got to do something else. If we could approach our lives from a space of experimentation until we get to the right solution, we wouldn't be so afraid of getting it wrong. And I think it would really lower a lot of the stress. It would lower a lot of the pressure. I think we'd see more freedom and creativity. I think we'd see more people try stuff and be weird and experiment. And I think art would explode and business and science and all of it because we wouldn't be living in failure of getting it wrong. So I mean, I have said for as long as I've had a platform and as long as I've been a writer that people will continue to watch me fail. And it has happened again and again. I've failed publicly many times. But what I'm here to do is learn and evolve. I'm willing to have a failure occasionally because that was the cost of the lesson I needed to learn. I just have a different perception about it than most. And I think that that is what helps me to keep trying, to keep growing, and ultimately to keep achieving new levels of success because I'm willing to keep showing up. 
I think those are very important points. And I think in my life, I've experienced that there are times when I go through periods where as difficult as it may be, I'm in a season where I must let go of things. And what is your advice for a listener around that topic? How do you determine what a must is in your life? And when do you see the time to let things go? And is there some type of process that you've come to learn over time and how to do that? Well, I think a really powerful prayer or meditation or just affirmation, depending on what you believe in, let whatever needs to come, come and let whatever needs to go, go and let me be okay with both of those things. The things that I thought were absolute must haves, if I look at my past, I realized sometimes flat out, I did not need them at all. And sometimes just didn't work in the way I thought they would or weren't as helpful as I thought they might be. And then other things that I was like, I don't want God, I don't want this God, I don't want this thing ended up being the greatest blessings in my life. So I really believe that we are guided. I believe that I have guardian angels. I believe in a God that is divine and is leading me on a clear path. But whatever people believe in, just something bigger than themselves, I think if you look at your past, it's often the best example you have and the best hype squad of what it looks like to have faith in your next step, right? So if I look at my path, I can see times where I was absolutely guided and this thing that I thought I didn't want ended up being great and vice versa. I can look at my past and see stuff that I should have let go of a lot sooner. We do that, right? We hold on. We're like, no, we're going to make this work. I'm going to beat this dead horse. I'm going to keep trying to get this thing to go. And it's really when we surrender that I think, number one, you just experience freedom. I'm sure you know this and listeners know this, like, pressure that we're all carrying around on our shoulders, right? To be the best, to be right, to make more money, to achieve more, to have more, to do these things. And when you really can get to a place of surrender, when you really are comfortable with how much you have, how blessed you are, how you're working on yourself, how you're doing your best. I think that that's when we experience life the way it's meant to be experienced. And the faster you can get to that place of letting go, the better you're going to feel. So my advice in that instance is if it feels too scary to let go in all respects, try surrendering in just one area. Try just one thing I say to what I believe in, but listeners can say to whatever they believe in, just like, all right, God, all right, universe, all right, source. I don't got this. If you could send me some help, if you could send me some guidance, it could be something as simple as like, I'll give you an example. So I have two kids in the same elementary school. I'm so grateful for our schools, but the pickup to pick my kids up from school every day is so insane. I'm telling you, it takes an hour from the time that I'm at the school to get up in the pickup line to pick them up. And that's the only way to get them. And I've just sort of resigned myself to this is what it is to have two kids in this school. And it means that basically I got to be done with my day pretty early to be able to accommodate these little kids and be in their taxi. It's part of being a mom. But I've just sort of like thrown this thing up, right? Like, okay, if, if I'm just supposed to be a carpool this year, then that is what I'm supposed to be doing. But man, this is really cutting into writing time. And it would be so great for this to not be. And last night at dinner, my 10 year old was like, mom, you can take the bus, right? (laughs) I was like, what are you talking? What do you mean? He's like, well, you know, we could take the bus. We could take the bus to dad's house and you could just pick us up at dad's house. There's a stop right by his dad's house. So you could pick us up at the bus stop and then you wouldn't have to wait in the carpool line for an hour. This is from a 10 year old. And I was like, <laughs> thank you for it. You are my <laughs> king. Like, but honestly, I had just sort of given that up. I wasn't trying to fix it. I wasn't trying to solve it. And certainly I'm sure if I had done more research, I could have figured that out. But I really find that if I just will release things like that, I'll get an answer really quickly. I'll be guided or someone will give me advice or I'll see something. So I know I'm a big time hippie and I'm very woo woo, but that is my best advice for letting go. When you do and you get the result that you were hoping for, it'll teach you to do it in the bigger areas of your life. Since you brought up your kids again and you brought up your ex-husband, how do your kids feel about having two parents who are very much in the public eye? 
they don't know another existence, right? So they've always had, even before I had published my first book, anything like that, their dad was a really high level executive at Disney. So they've always had parents that have had pretty big jobs. I think when I was earlier in my career, I know this sounds silly, but it felt to me like the world and social media and all of it was much smaller. I came up, I built a business, building a community and then telling them, hey, I have this book or hey, I have this podcast. And back then, my children really, they are obviously such a huge part of my life. And so I would talk about them a lot. I would show them a lot. And I've made a conscious decision in the last two years to stop, stop putting them on social, stop sharing their faces, stop doing those things because this was my choice to step into this space, but it wasn't theirs. And any stories that I share about them, I did a podcast, golly, last, maybe earlier this year, I can't even remember, everything's smashing together in my mind. But it is a podcast where I talked about my oldest son being gay. And that was something he and I had discussed for a while before he's out publicly in our town. We live in Austin, but it wasn't something I'd ever said on a podcast or anything like that. So those kind of things were, that's a discussion that we have, but I think more than anything, For me, it's about how can I do this work in a way that still is protective of their privacy and that I'm not discussing things that they wouldn't want told or shared. I'm sure Ford doesn't mind that I told you that he gave me the answer to the bus route. But yeah, they don't know another world. And I think that this is a really powerful piece of advice. This could show up in a lot of ways, but I remember when I was, um, when I had my first son and I was going to go back to work and I had so much shame about going back to work because I had a lot of pressure and a lot of voices telling me that if I was a quote unquote good mom, that I would stay home with him. But I've always really loved my work and been passionate about it. And I didn't want to give up my career. And I was like, well, certainly there's a way I could do both. And I remember a woman telling me, oh, it's fine because he's not going to know a world where he doesn't have a working mom. And that was so helpful for me. Like our children will just understand the world that they're inside of. So for them, they're just like, yeah, my mom's an author, right? It's not really something they care that much about or think that much about. Yeah. An author who has sold just 10 million books. <laughs> well, but like to women, so they don't really, I'm sure if I was selling like ready player one, my kids would think I was a lot cooler, but they're selling books to women about personal development. They're, they don't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have gone through the same thing you have with my kids and my daughter specifically does not like anything shared on social media. And if I do share a picture or something, she wants to okay it before I do it. <laughs> but I've kind of adopted that with my older son as well. There's really not a need to put them out there that right. much. The occasional picture when we're together, I think is fine, but I try not to do it too much. And I was going to ask you about your social media strategy because you have changed it, but I think you just answered that. Yeah. I really wanted for a very long time because there was this big business attached to my name. There were 60 employees that had payroll and insurance and 401ks. And ultimately we all worked to build this thing, but so much of that was built around me speaking, me writing books. It was a lot of pressure for a very long time. And I think I'm still recovering from the psychological stress of that. I'm really proud of what we did as a company. And I'm really proud of the team and all the things that we did and the women that we served in order for that machine to run at that pace, there's a certain level of like requirement that people have. And social media was definitely one of those things. There was a time where I just lived on it. I lived on it and there was so much content and other people ran it and it would be like, Hey, can you do this? Can you do it? And I, you just get used to it. You do this thing. And I'm, there's a time for that, right? Like when the rock is launching a new movie, he's all over social media. Cause that's part of his job. But for me, I really want to have a good real life. This is my real life and it's really good. And I find that when I'm required to get on social and I'm required to, I feel a bit like I'm tap dancing or like I'm trying, I just, I can't play that game anymore. I can't like get a blowout and have makeup done and have nails. And like, I just, 
not to say that that's what's required, but because that was my past, it sort of feels like that to me. So part of making a change was I wanted really what you see to truly be a reflection of who I am and what is really happening. And I found, and I believe this and I stand by this forever, that if you do really good work, and you focus hard on creating great content and serving your audience, your audience is gonna find you. And you don't need, at least I don't think, that I need to be present constantly like that in order to serve my community. And I haven't found that to be true. I've found that the more I settle into my authentic self and the more I just keep showing up for my community, the bigger the numbers get. And the better we do. So I'm just going to keep on doing that. Yeah, I wasn't going to ask this question, but it kind of just triggered in my mind. And that is you've now had this community for quite a long time. And it's like 15 million plus. What are some of the core values that you hear from this community back to you? Oh, golly, I honestly, I don't know if I could, I know my core values. And I think that as creators as thought leaders or teachers or podcast hosts or whatever your audience is, we tend to attract an audience that shares our values. So my greatest core value in life is I want to be the best version of myself. I want to get to 95 years old and look at 39 year old Rach and be like, oh girl, you were barely starting. Like you didn't even know. You, I believe that evolution is what we're here to do. And I want to get to the other side of this life and feel like I led with my whole heart and I lived well and I grew and I changed and I challenged myself. And that's who I tend to attract are people who are on a similar path or who maybe are just starting out and they're not really sure what to do, or maybe they just want encouragement. They want someone else to be like, yeah, girl, I get it. Like it's hard, but you can do this and you're strong enough and you got it. So yeah, that's who I tend to attract are people who hold those same values. I think that's true. I've found it in my own case as more people find the podcast and more things that I'm doing. So I think there's definitely truth that the core values you put out and the ideals that you put out are going to respond to people and over time, they organically find it through Absolutely. their searching. Absolutely. Well, speaking of communities, I asked my community if they had any questions they might want to ask you. And I told them I'd bring a couple of them up. And this one comes from a gentleman named Eric. I know for myself personally, and I've tried to give my kids this advice, I have had to continually reinvent myself time and time again throughout my career. I've gone from military officer to strategy consultant to Fortune 50 executive, then CEO in private equity world to now entrepreneur doing what I'm doing. And when I look at your life, you started out as a food blogger, you were an event planner, you became this head of a lifestyle business, podcaster. And the question Eric wanted to know is, what have you found are the keys to evolving or reinventing your business and yourself over the last 16 years? Such a good question, Eric. Gosh, the keys. One, to just be open to that's the process. I think we can all look at people in our field or in our area of interest that at one time we were like, holy crap, there is nobody bigger. Like they are the biggest thing ever. There were a lot of lifestyle bloggers when I started my blog back in 2008. And there were women that I absolutely emulated and wanted to be like, and just thought, oh my gosh, if I could be friends with this person, or if I could ever be on that level. And now you see people and you're like, oh, you're still doing the same thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like everybody gets to choose their path and gets to do what they want to do in life. But if we're looking back 15 years later, a lot of things, especially if we're businesses that in any way are tied to technology or the internet, that is shifting and changing so fast that if you're not willing to evolve with it, you're not going to continue to experience the same level of success that you once did. And I actually think that's one of the scariest things for people. It's very easy to change and adjust and try new stuff when nobody cares about your work. 
when you are just starting out, when you're throwing things at the wall and hoping someone sticks, it's so easy to try things. When you experience success though, that's when trying new stuff gets terrifying. That's when I feel like we dig our heels in and we say, this is what I do and I'm never changing because I know that this works. I've told you my greatest value is growth, right? So for me, I could, honest to God, I could have written a different version of Girl Wash Your Face over and over and over again. And I would fly around the world on a golden jet and I would be super rich and I would, I don't know, have homes and whatever and be totally unfulfilled. Because when you have success, like that book was successful, that's all anybody wants you to do. Keep doing this thing, keep being this person, keep making this for us, right? Feed this machine. And what I have discovered is that that it just makes me deeply unhappy. And I think the entrepreneur in me is always going to want to try something new, even at the risk that it might not work. So I'm doing this right now. I would argue that I'm probably one of the most successful people at creating conferences for women. I, I do the Rise Conference. I've done it for five or six years, women from all over the world. I don't know that anybody does things at the level that we do them or have this many women come or have this many lives affected. Um, I could keep doing the Rise Conference. I could, and it would be awesome and it would be great, but I've done it for a very long time and I feel like it's time to evolve. So for the first time ever this fall, we're doing a tour. Instead of asking people to all come to the same city for three days, I'm going into individual cities, right? I'm going into Omaha, I'm going into Charleston, South Carolina, or Detroit, or Chicago. And my intention with that was I wanted to serve people who couldn't afford to fly in for a conference. I thought, well, if I bring this to them, right? And if the ticket's 40 bucks, instead of a conference where it's 300, could I serve a different audience? Could I help people that maybe wouldn't normally get to experience community of women coming together and men too, but like believing in themselves and feeling fired up and trying new stuff and finding people who will be your hype squad. Like this is an experiment. Is it gonna work? I sure hope so, but I have no idea. We're going to cities where personal development isn't as big of a thing, right? If you go to Birmingham, Alabama, which is an amazing city, but maybe not a space for personal development, you're not only creating a new thing, you're also asking people to like try something they've never tried before. But if I'm not afraid of failure, cause like literally some cities, 300 people have bought tickets, some cities, a thousand people have bought tickets. But dude, if one person wants to pay to hear me talk, holy crap, let's go. Like, I will never, I will never forget what it feels like the very first time that someone comes up to my table and asks me if I'll sign their book. I'll never forget what it feels like to have one person wanna buy a ticket to my very first conference. So I just think I have a different perception. Like I have experienced really massive success in the eyes of the world. But for me, I'm willing to experiment and try things and see what else is out there because my version of success is very small. So I think for Eric, as long as he stays tied to what does success look like to me, maybe success to him is like, I want to make sure that I'm home for dinner every night with my kids. Maybe success for him is I want to make a million dollars. But if you know what your truth is, what is your North Star, you can iterate in a million different ways about how that North Star gets followed as long as you stay true to what the core is. I think there's so much value in that answer. Thank you. And yeah. I'm just going to share a quick little story about something you brought up. And I'm not sure if you're a fan of beer. Yes, I Dog am. Absolutely. Dogfish Beer out of Delaware has something called the 60-Minute IPA. And when they came out with it, it was so successful that all of a sudden it became 80% of their beer sales. And the founder of that company looked at it and made this really hard decision. He realized that in the future, people's tastes are gonna change and IPAs might not be the pinnacle of what people wanna drink. So 
he put a governor on it and said, at no point will it ever exceed, let's just say it was 50% of our sales. And it ended up really upsetting a lot of fans and distributors and bar owners because he wouldn't sell it. But years went by and it turned out in the long term to be the right strategy because he ended up making hundreds of millions of dollars later on. But I think that's also advice for Eric as well is play the long game as well. Absolutely. I wanted to ask you, especially since you're going on to this tour to places where people might not know you as well and haven't had a chance to go to your conferences, what do people get wrong about you? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, it's the internet. So everything that you could possibly make up, I honestly try not to pay attention because some things are so crazy. You sort of get frustrated that you want to defend yourself. And like, I remember like when I went through my divorce, people like, oh, it's because she's like hooking up with this guy. And I was like, like, it was so disgusting. And it was based on nothing other than internet rumor. But the crazy thing about the internet is that people will believe it if they see it in writing or it's just like entertaining or it's fodder. And I'm sure I'm guilty of that. I'm positive. I've seen stuff about celebrities before and been like, oh my gosh, Robert Downey Jr. is half unicorn. Like that's crazy. (laughs) Like you just see something you're like, oh, that's interesting. We're human and I'm guilty of it too. I think for me, I just, I don't pay attention because ultimately if you don't know someone personally, it's impossible to actually know who they are. I care very little about what people think of me. I care most what I think of myself. I want to be proud of myself. And I want to love myself and feel like I'm doing the very best that I can. And I think we get it twisted when we worry about what other people are thinking or saying or doing, because you can't fight against that, right? There are people who love and adore me, but also probably love and adore me based on their perception of me that isn't real. So either way, it's not something that's really relevant to my life. Well, thank you for sharing that. I have a great example of that. Who's someone who lives in your backyard. Uh, When I lived in Austin, I used to go to Riverbend Church. And after we'd been going for about a year, a gentleman started showing up with his wife and two kids. And it happened to be Matthew McConaughey. And he would come every single week. And I had these preconceived ideas from what you read about him, what you've heard about him, the stories, et cetera. And I found him to be just a completely different person in so many different ways and someone who wanted to have deep connections with others and was really humble and outgoing and just wanted human connection. And so I think he's incredible. They both, you just don't know because what you see isn't reality. Right. I wanted to go in a little bit different direction. So you and I are both high achievers. (laughs) And I have this big issue where I have had success, different types of success than you, but I never celebrate it. I mean, if it lasts for five, 10 minutes, I would say that's a long time and I'm on to the next thing. And you've also had massive success. And I wanted to ask, I think a lot of people feel this way. What have you found over time is your secret for enjoying the moments of success and progress when they come? Well, I definitely have had to work on this as well. This was a really hard thing for me. I know you said you listened to my Ben Hardy interview. For you, if you haven't, or listeners, if they haven't, reading The Gap Versus the Gain by Ben Hardy is one of the most profound written pieces on this exact problem. How do we stop this mentality of like, I achieved it and it's done. Like, I don't even feel the moment or I feel the moment for two seconds. Essentially, the idea is that we teach ourselves to measure backwards, not forwards. So good. And everyone should go get it, go buy it, go support him. He's an incredible author. For me, this definitely was something that I had to work on. And I don't know that I ever would have worked on it from a place of oh, I just, I should celebrate more. I should feel this more. I really only started working on it because I was very, very burnout. It was just running and hustling and working endlessly for years. And 
none of it mattered. And I used to say all the time, I would say to my friends, like, I don't feel this. I'd stand on a stage, 18,000 people in an arena, or I'd open for Oprah, or I just have these like incredible moments that were like lifetime achievements for me. I would be almost numb to them. And for a long time, I sort of would tell myself that that was like healthy because I was like, well, I've got to be humble because if I feel this too much, then maybe I'm going to get a big head. But what I actually understand I was doing in retrospect was I was being dismissive. I was sort of sloughing off anything that would have given me some like sense of purpose in that or allowed me to feel that in a different way. So I actually think it was really unhealthy and I just didn't know better. So I feel like one, recognize that you've got a problem, recognize that it is a problem, recognize that if you are going to work this freaking hard, that you need to celebrate it and you need to acknowledge it. And it doesn't have to be a massive party though. I mean, that's cool too. I think it's about having little moments of something that you can do that is an acknowledgement for you. So I really love a celebratory glass of champagne. I'm not like going to drink champagne on the average Tuesday, but I feel like there's something that feels very special about a glass of champagne. So if it's a big moment, I want to just acknowledge it in a simple way. It doesn't have to be that second, but I do want to have a moment where like I sit down and I like give myself that, that moment I signed a contract yesterday for a new podcast partner. And it's one of the biggest deals I've ever had in my career. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. I was here by myself. There was like no one to celebrate with. I'm obviously not going to have a glass of champagne in the middle of like a Wednesday. I got to go do carpool later. But I just sat with that for a minute, like, holy crap. Rage. Like these last two years have been brutal and this has been hard, but you need to acknowledge like my podcast a few weeks ago just passed a hundred million downloads. That's a number that my brain can't even hold, right? But if I just rush past that stuff, if I don't take a second and like soak that in, what are we doing? Like, what is any of this for? And also for anybody listening who has children celebrate your wins with your kids. Kids love any reason to celebrate. Maybe you're like training for your first half marathon and you ran a mile without puking. Celebrate that with your kids. Let them see you winning and achieving things and acknowledging it because man, life is supposed to be beautiful. It's it. Yes. We have hard seasons and things suck a lot sometimes, but If you're going to have those moments that are good, acknowledge them. Because I really do think it's like getting a little taste of something that then you want more of. Because otherwise you're just spinning your wheels and none of it matters. and None of it hits you. I just today passed a big milestone for this show. We crossed 2 million downloads, which for me was something when I started. I never thought I'd see a million, much less... 2 million. There's so few podcasters who've accomplished what you've accomplished. I can think of maybe Lewis Howes, Jordan Harbinger, yourself. I think Kathy Heller might be on her way to achieving that. Maybe Andrew Huberman, but you're in a very exclusive club. Well, I was going to bring up Ben Hardy's interview because I have to give a selfish plug for my own show. He's coming up on our show as well. Cool. And I live in Tampa and he lives in Orlando. So maybe right. I've got to do, do this, you get should. together I mean, with I him. literally just had him come to the house. <laughs> During that interview, one of the things that uh, you brought up was this whole topic of, we often are taught it's about how, not about what. And I loved how you brought up that you really need to double down on the what. Why did you give that advice? Because I think... Oh, what is, I think Tony Robbins calls it the tyranny of how, that we will get so obsessed with how something can be accomplished. So we'll talk ourselves out of it. And when you get really, really, really focused on what, what do I want? What do I want my life to look like? What do I want our family's life to look like? What do I want for my business? What do I want to do in revenue this year? What do I want in downloads on the podcast? That's us setting intentionality, right? That's us calling our shot and saying, this is the direction that I want to go. And when you call your shot, 
there's no guarantee that you're going to get exactly to the spot that you pointed out on the map, but you'll get close or even better, you'll surpass it by so much just by having clear direction to head to. So if you think about what it is you're trying to do, I think that it gives us excitement. We imagine, we see things. I mean, if you're like me, you go on Pinterest and you build a vision board so that you can have visuals to come back to and get all excited about the goal in front of you. I mean, I'll tell you with tour, it's this experiment. I don't know what's going to happen. So for me, I just imagine over and over and over the what is I'm standing on stage and maybe there's 10 people in the audience. Maybe there's 2000 people in the audience, but those people are there, right? That's what I see in my mind. The what gives us energy. The how can deplete us or scare us or make us take a step back. So if you're not very good at what, grab some friends, get a mastermind together, get a group of people, get coworkers, get other people that are really good at imagination, get your kids involved. My kids can dream up stuff I would never think of. And for that group, just allow yourselves to dream and plan and talk about ideas because there's this great line in, oh golly, I'm forgetting. Oh, I'm mad at myself for forgetting the book. I can't think of what it is right now. I think we actually talked about this in the podcast, but he essentially says when people are trying to figure out if they should keep chasing the dream or quit, that what most people do is either quit or just stay doing what they're doing. And he's like, look, the opposite of quitting isn't just to stay in the monotony of your current life. The opposite of quitting is recommitting with passion. It's getting really excited. It's getting really clear. It's having clarity of purpose and like energy, right? Like it's something different than just like, all right, I'll just keep trucking and we'll see what happens. So if you focus on the what, I feel like it gives you energy. And that's what you need when the motivation has lost you, when the feeling that, you know, why you started, when that's sort of gone, when you're feeling unmotivated, when you're feeling stuck or unsure, that passion, that's what's going to make you stand up and go again. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I'm going to follow it up with this in uh, Don't See That Coming. You talk at the end of the book about how to imagine the future version of yourself and you provide some advice. And I was hoping because I thought it was such great advice that you could share some of that with the audience. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's hard to remember exactly what I, because I've written 10 books, but I'll tell you just my advice and hopefully it aligns with the book. For me, I like to encourage people to do a meditation. So if you've never done that before, there's a ton that you can find on YouTube. You can go to episode 72 of my podcast. It's way back in the archives, but if you go to episode 72 of my podcast, I guide you through a full meditation to help you visualize the future version of you. So it's essentially like put on some groovy music, close your eyes, do it when you've got some energy so you're not going to fall asleep and start to think about if I was living every single day as the very best version of me, if I was showing up, if I was keeping those habits and those processes and I was doing these things that I know I should be doing every single day for the next five years, what could I achieve? What would that look like? Where would I live? Where would I shop? Where would I go on dates with my boyfriend? Where would I go grocery shopping? How would my body feel? How would my energy be? How would I interact with my kids? How old are my kids going to be five years from now? Where do I want the business to be? The more information you can give yourself, the faster your thoughts will run. And I find that the faster you can imagine, the less you'll judge your thoughts. So if you just stay in that, what could it be? What could it be? What could it be? Dreaming right? Of this future version of you, you give yourself, like I said, a spot on the map. You give yourself somewhere to head. Most people, I think, will go through their entire lives and never ask who it is that they want to be or how they want to show up in this world. And I think maybe we do that because we don't know that we have control over how we turn out. Or maybe we do that because we're scared that if we actually called our shot, that then we feel even more shame because we aren't living up to our potential. 
But whatever the reason, most people won't do it. And there is crazy power in just knowing who it is you want to become. I really think that when you say, okay, this is what it is. I want to be this person, or I want to be a New York Times bestseller. I want to have a podcast. I want to build a family where we break generational cycles that I've been dealing with. These are the things I want. I think when you call those shots, the universe rises up to meet you. It puts people in your path. You're standing in line for coffee and you hear someone talking about the exact answer that you needed to a solution. You meet someone at your kid's back to school night who can be the exact employee that you need to take the business to the next level. But like, dude, if you don't call the shot, if you don't at least ask, if you don't at least set that intention, there's nothing that can support you in the dream. And you're just going to keep in the monotony of your current life. I think that's great advice. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Robin Sharma, but it's philosophy that he gives out as well. I, no one would ever want my used books because I, like yours, I highlight it. I don't know if you can see nice. that. But I, oh, I love that. But I want to read this because I read this and it was so profound when I read it. it. You wrote, we are only ever in control of ourselves and our actions in the moment. That statement holds utter limitation or ultimate opportunity. And I love that. And the only thing that will decide which way it lands in your life is how do you choose to view those words? And I wanted to ask, how have you made the choice then instead of looking at the limitation, you've looked at the ultimate opportunity. I've had this since I was little. I've had this since I was little. And I really do think it comes from having a really hard beginning and having a lot of trauma in my childhood that my imagination is how I took myself out of hard circumstances. I would lay in bed and I would just dream of something different. And I just always did that. Always, always, always. So by the time I was in middle school, I already saw the path. I knew that I was going to graduate high school and move to Los Angeles. I knew I was going to work in the film industry. I knew that that's where my future was. And I obsessed about it. And I thought about it over and over and over and over. Uh, So for me, if I get too bogged down in limitations, I'm not myself, something's off, something's not right. The times where the limitations are sort of surrounding me are the times in my life where the season is so hard that I'm not emotionally or mentally in the place that I would be if I was ultimately healthy. So that's actually a sign to me. Like if I'm feeling like I'm focusing too much on the negative, it's actually a signal like, oh, something's off. Maybe we need to call the therapist. Maybe we need to invest in some more self-care. Maybe we need to adjust our supplements or do some things because when I'm at my best, it's always with a vision. I don't really worry too much about what other people think of the vision or all the reasons that other people think it's not possible because honestly, if I ever had been invested in that, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation because I have never one time, not once, even today, come up with an idea for a book, a podcast, a movie, anything, any project, and ever had people go, yes, do that thing. That's a great idea. You should totally do that. Never, 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 never. So if that's true, then like, in fact, if people think something is a good idea, probably should run in the other direction. Every single thing I've ever tried, I've had to prove that it has value every single time. So I just always assume that it's going to be hard, but I know that I'm willing to work for it. And I know that I'm willing to learn. I know that I'm willing to fail and stand back up and go again. And I think that if you have those skills and they are skills, they're learnable things, but if you have those skills, I think that ultimately you're unstoppable. Yeah, so I can tell you, if I would have listened to people about starting Passion Struck, I would have never done it. And then when I thought about starting the podcast, people were like, it's too saturated. And I look back 18 months later, look at where things are at. If I just choose to look at my own intuition and go with my gut on it. Absolutely. So I'm going to ask a selfish question from one podcast host to another. How do you go about selecting your podcast guests? Do you like pitches or do you seek out who you want on the show? 
Great question. I don't like pitches, actually. I did that for a very long time. I had like a, a booker, someone who would reach out and book people onto the show. And I feel like ultimately that was some of the most disconnected work that I did. And that, to be honest, it felt like just trying to like get the right amount of episodes to appease advertisers or whatever. It wasn't me connected to the work. And it was also what other people thought I should be talking about, not what I really wanted to talk about. So I wish I could show you just the stacks of books around this office. I am a voracious reader. I read constantly. I read almost exclusively nonfiction. So I would say one out of every five books I read and then I freak out and I'm like, oh my gosh, who is this? I have to talk to this. So like a really good example, have you ever read The Big Leap? by Gay Hendricks? I have not. Oh, get it. It's so good. So I discovered it recently. I'm a huge fan of Wayne Dyer. I wish I had been able to meet him when he was still alive, but I reread his books a lot. He has a book that I love that I've read like 10 times called The Power of Intention, which you care about. Intention, I love, you probably yes. Would, you would probably dig. And in that book, on a recent reread, he mentions Gay Hendricks. A quote and whatever the quote was, I was like, well, that sounds interesting. So I end up going on Amazon and I get the big leap, which is so good and everyone should grab. And it's all about why we as humans self-sabotage. Why do you get to like, oh, you're just about to have success. You're just about to do this thing. And then sort of everything goes to crap. So I read that book and then immediately just started buying this man's entire back catalog. He wrote a book with his wife called Conscious Loving, the book PhDs, and just fell in love with his style and his word and then reached out. I mean, literally the amount of publicists that are like, what? Because I just will be like, hi, Rachel Hollis. <laughs> but I would love to get your author on my show. And they're like, what are you doing? I literally just reach out myself. And I actually have quite a lot of people who do pitch and I appreciate it, but I've just found that I'm so much more connected to the work if I am organically finding and then talking about things that I'm really interested in. Because for my audience, I really want them to know if you're listening to someone on my show, it's, it's real. Like I vetted this person. I really feel like this is an important conversation. It's not someone who's like just on a book tour and kind of um, trying to give me their six bullet points, if that makes sense. So I have had a number of guests on the show, and this has come up with Gretchen Rubin, Liz Fosslane, Susan Cain. I mean, I could go on but they're all bringing up perfectionism. And we both have kids. I just went through this period with my daughter, especially through her last two years where she was definitely, I think, feeling it that not only did she have to have the grades and do the AP courses, but she had to get the community service and she had to be in the right clubs and she had to get the right awards and she had to play in the right sports and this and that. And I think there's so many of your kids, my kids, those who are joining the workforce and even older than that, who are dealing with whether you call it effortless perfection or perfectionism in general. And I know a lot of women watch and listen to this podcast as well. What is your advice to them on how do you tackle this? And it's not just a female thing. Males go through this as well. So yeah, I did want to give that um, caveat. Yeah, I feel like we should call bullshit on this. You can bleep me if you need to, but it feels important enough to cuss about. We have to say it. We have to say that it's not okay. We have to say that it's hurting our kids. We have to say these things to normalize it. So it's really interesting. My oldest son is at whatever the highest GPA you could have, he's got it. Whatever the highest level class, whatever, could he take college credit? Could he do... From the time he was a little boy, he's talked about wanting to go to an Ivy League college. And he's a sophomore this year. And this is the first year that we went and met with the school counselor to talk about that and mapping it out. And he's like naming colleges and maybe it's this and maybe it's that. And I'm the mom that's like, I mean, yeah, but like also UT is great. I feel like maybe you take a gap year and like you go to Europe and you, because we did not give it, his father and I, we did not give this to him. He really is this kid, but 
I also don't think that it's a healthy mentality. And what I worry about, I know a lot of parents would probably be super pumped if their kid was like working really hard because they wanted to go to Stanford or something. But for me, I care more about his heart. I care more about how, it, like emotionally, how is he doing? And I've seen with him and his friends that the anxiety has increased as their desire to have a higher GPA has increased. And so I just continue to talk to him and them and lean into this idea. We have like big family dinners once a month and like the, the teenagers will bring their friends. And I am like the mom that to all the teenagers, like, I promise you, I promise that in 10 years, you will not remember what your, you do. You won't care what your GPA was sophomore year. And you're stressing yourself out so badly trying to hit a level of perfection that doesn't matter. And I know there are parents who would disagree because they're like, no, my kid's job is to get this GPA and to get into college. But whether it's kids or ourselves, it's like, to what end? Why? Why? Why does that matter? I suppose if there are, no, I know that there are certain jobs where going to a specific school would make a difference. But if you're just doing it because you want the clout of being able to say that you did it, I just feel like it comes to the detriment of your life experience, whether it's the way that your body's supposed to look or how your family's supposed to function. All of this comes back to this idea of failure and other people seeing us fail. Man, maybe you run towards failure. Maybe you purposely do things that you don't think that you should do just to prove to yourself that life keeps spinning on its axis and it is okay. Because I have never met a single person who was a perfectionist and they felt good. I've met a lot of perfectionists who are incredible athletes, musicians, and the perfectionism led to a level of artistry or athleticism that we all idolize, right? But I can also tell you that those people behind the scenes are some of the most emotionally unhealthy people I know because they're drowning in the stress that they've created for themselves. So I guess it really comes back to values. My value in life is not to live a life or to have my kids live a life that looks good from the outside. My value in life is to have a life that feels good on the inside. And if it feels good on the inside to you, there's a really strong chance that somebody else will find it lacking. And if you're pursuing perfection, it's someone else's ideal. No baby comes into this world and is trying to be a perfectionist. Those are learned behaviors. And if it's learned, then it's not that still small voice inside of you. It's not your intuition. It's not your soul. It's not your greater source. So I'm just going to keep coming back to calling BS when I see it and hopefully living life in a way that is very, very, very imperfect, but still trying my best. Yeah, I had a guest on the show one time and I love her line. She says, we are all perfectly imperfect. Yeah. And that's absolutely. really what we need to embrace. Yep. Well, Rachel, um, you've got this big tour coming up. If people want to learn more about it and how they can see you live, what's the best way for them to do it? Yeah. Oh gosh. I hope your listeners want to come out and hang out with us. It really is this idea of reconnecting to your vision, that future version of yourself. How do you reconnect to that? And also how do you reconnect within your own community with people who are like-minded? So you can go to rachtalklive.com. And yes, I am a woman, but I promise there will be dudes there. They'll be mostly women. I'm not going to lie, but there's always like boyfriends and husbands and brothers in the crowd. So whoever you are, if you're looking for community, uh, we create a really good one. So I hope you'll join us. Well, thank you so much. I feel completely blessed having you on the show. It was truly an honor and a joy. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I hope that I, I served your audience well. What a fantastic interview that was with Rachel Hollis. And I wanted to thank Rachel for giving us the honor of interviewing her. Links to all things Rachel will be in the show notes at passionstruck.com. Please use our website links if you buy any of the books from the guests that we feature on the show. All the proceeds go to supporting this show and making it free for you, our listener. Videos, 
are on YouTube at John R. Miles. We now have well over 400 of them. Please go there and subscribe. Advertiser deals and discount codes are in one convenient place at passionstruck.com slash deals. Please support those who support this show. I'm at John R. Miles, both on Instagram and Twitter. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. And if you want to know how I book amazing guests like Rachel, it's because of my network. Go out there and build yours now before you need it. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview I did with Douglas Rushkoff, who's a professor at the City University of New York, the author of 20 best-selling books, including his newly launched book, Survival of the Richest. I go to this crazy resort in the middle of the desert. They bring me out in a golf cart to this other part of the facility and I'm waiting in my green room for them to come with a microphone they clip on you and you go out and do your talk instead of bringing me out they bring these five guys into my green room and they sit around this little round table and they start peppering me with these questions about the digital future then finally they get to the question Alaska or New Zealand where should they put their bunker for the coming apocalypse. And the question that ended up taking up the majority of the hour was, how do I maintain control of my security staff once my money is worthless? The fee for this show is that you share it with family or friends when you find something that's useful or interesting. If you know someone who's really into manifesting their best self, definitely share the episode with Rachel with them. The greatest compliment that you can give us is to share this show with those that you care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on this show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, live life passion struck.